Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast. You've joined us towards the end of our 12 plus week series, Innovative Disruption, recalibrating our mission to the movement of God. As always, we are here with Michael, a resident of physiologist, and I'm Andrew Johnson, a pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas. This is our 11th episode in the series, and we are digging into the second to last section today of Innovative Disruption, Adaptive Ecclesiology, Part 3. Michael, we have somehow figured out how to make three parts out of adaptive <laughs> ecclesiology. I don't know if this is an achievement or a shame, but uh, here we are. It's here we are. Yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, this is, I think for me, as I think about what it is that we're talking about, um, it, this is an exciting part from a missiological perspective, because okay. here is where we get to really think and uh, and apply what we talk about in missiological discovery uh, and being curious about what the Lord is doing and discovering those things that he's doing and then beginning to think creatively about what, what does that mean and how can it be expressed in terms of his people, his, the body of Christ. And, mm -hmm. and so I, this is a favorite uh, part of innovative disruption. Okay. So this is for those who are keeping track we are in our descent, right? So we are, we the plane is coming to land. We will not land it in this episode because we are moving towards exactly what Michael you just said. It's it's that missiological lens that is moving towards action. So this is not just a nice um, high minded ivory tower conversation where we're just talking about things of the um, things of academia, but it's more of like so. How does this show up in your life? Yeah. What does this look like? But we're not there yet. Um, there's a few there's a few um, stones we need to set as we are making our way there. And so one of those is talking again more about that idea of the ecclesia. Uh, what mm -hmm. what is the church? Yeah, yeah, because we we sometimes are confused by that, just because it's church. The English word church has taken on such a cultural tone that um, we have created in our minds that church is a place where we go, mm -hmm. um, and this isn't unique, of course, to the twenty first century or the twentieth century. Uh, this is something that begins early in the history of the church. In fact, uh, dating all the way to the third century, Clement of Alexandria begins to use that same language, talking about people going to church and when they go to church that they should be properly attired and so on. So there's a long history about this shift away from an understanding of ecclesia as the gathering of God's people, wherever they are, not just on a particular day, to mm -hmm. a, a place, a location uh, that, uh, that people are coming together and having certain things that they're expected to do in that place. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, so it's important that we we give some good thought to, to what ecclesia means. And, and then as we're moving into this, to see how different it was in different places. And this is what's amazing to me. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten to the place where church has become a monolithic system. And uh, that system is observed all over the world. And there are very few differences uh, in that system. And yet, mm. when we look at the ecclesia in the first century, boy, there were, there were huge differences in what that looked like. Okay, let me play. Before we get into the differences that we see, before we get into a really great quote and idea uh, from Ralph Corner, I did want to ask, what what's the problem if the church across the world tends to look the same? What What is the problem if... Uh, there is a consistency and a cohesion so that everybody everywhere knows this is what it looks like to be a Christian. Um, what's the problem, Michael? Well, the main problem is that taking such a position 
makes the church look foreign in places where the system didn't develop. And so what, what we see is that's what missions has done uh, over the centuries. It's taken a system that is largely Western and has uh, propagated that system as being the church system for other parts of the world with uh, un really unintended consequences that it has become foreign looking. And, uh, and this is interesting. This is coming out of some study that others have done on persecution that um, a, a, a big motivation of those who are persecuting the church around the world is that that church looks foreign. It's not theirs. It's something from the outside and it has Western attachments. And so therefore it threatens the cultures of different places and ultimately incites uh, some persecution. It's not always that way. I mean, sometimes <clears throat> persecution occurs when people are, Christians are genuinely sharing the gospel mm -hmm. and, uh, and people are coming to Christ and that, that will result in persecution in some spiritually dark places. But in, in other places, it's because of how foreign Christianity looks to the culture that Christianity becomes persecuted. And so what, what we're trying to suggest here is that in the early church, <clears throat> that church adapted wherever it was. It didn't take the same forms. It preserved the meaning, and that's a distinction, missiological distinction that we have to make, mm -hmm. is the difference between form and meaning. It preserves mm -hmm. the meaning of the church, the intention of ecclesia, but it adapts the form to the particular cultural context. That is, uh, that is a crucial distinction. And I know that we have, listeners, if you have been with us at any point in this podcast series, I, I think I'm not treading new ground. You know, we're not saying something new right now, but I think it's really clear for us to articulate, I don't want to say, what's so bad about it? Because there are, I mean, Orthodox churches, that's, that's kind of the M.O., Right. It's going to look the same, essentially, no matter where you are, if it's Russian Orthodoxy, Greek Orthodoxy, uh, it, it, it has the same a, a same feel. And for them, for those who are adhering to that part of the faith, that's a good thing, because anything outside of that regularity looks uh, heretical. And, mm -hmm. and we're just trying to posit that. Uh, while we might actually hold the meaning, that meaning of what is church is buried so far beneath the form that it is lost. And the aim of the church is, is now far afield. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, in one sense, we understand that uh, because it's human nature to desire uh, to be in places that make us feel comfortable. And so uh, when, when missionaries would go from one place to another, and this is inclusive of the Orthodox Church, th mm -hmm. those were places that made people feel comfortable. It made the missionaries feel comfortable that this is the way that we do things where we're from. Now, what, what we have to say about the Orthodox mission is that in, in many ways it was adaptive. Um, it was the Orthodox mission that really emphasized language, uh, the liturgy in the language of the people, which was not the practice of the Western church, the Catholic church, where language was in uh, the Latin primarily uh, up until the, the reforms in the 1900s. Um, so, yeah, so th those are things that we have to keep in mind. So, and I think it's important also to keep in mind that in spite of us being so monolithic in forms, uh, God still uses the church. He, he Absolutely. uses the church around the world. And, uh, and we can't forget that either. But at well, the and same thank God, can I jump yeah. in just only to say <laughs> that God wouldn't have used the church if we had to be perfect for him to use us or if we had to do it exactly right, because then the church would never, ever have gone forward. He is still using broken people who are in process and being made into his likeness. 
um, there's going to be, there are still going to be heirs. And through his grace, he still decides that his kingdom will go forth um, yeah. uh, through us and in spite of us sometimes. Yeah. Um, so praise God. Uh, but that doesn't mean then we just get to do whatever we want and God's still going <laughs> to. Yeah, we hurt a whole bunch of people, but God still moved. And I was like, no, let's let's work on not hurting a bunch of people. So there are ways that we as the church can operate that is closer to the ecclesia that the new testament speaks of yeah yeah and and i agree and and that's what we're trying to get at you know there's such a richness and diversity in god's people now the in people that have been created in his image that to um propagate a monolithic uh system that we call church uh, around the world, I think is is not recognizing how diverse of a people we are, and how in that diversity we can express ourselves in many different ways, and uh, and that's something that we want to celebrate. And 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 I I would suggest that it's something that is very Jesusy. Uh, mm. You know, Paul talks about in Philippians that Jesus came in the form of a servant. And uh, and his mentioning that uh, helps us to understand that Jesus manifests in places in different ways. And so we should rightly expect that the church also should manifest in different places in different ways. And so in the first century, Jesus manifests in a Jewish culture, uh, celebrating Jewish traditions, observing Jewish rituals and so on. But as we read in, in Revelation chapter 1, it, Jesus now is exalted. He's, he is in a form wholly other. Uh, it is glorified state. And so, so we need to be thinking, I think, a little bit more deliberately about what it means for the body of Christ to incarnate in a culture in the same way that Jesus incarnates in the first century. And that namely being that uh, the incarnation of his body in culture should take on the characteristics of the culture, language, traditions, dress, um, and, and so on. So this, so what you're, what you are in charge <laughs> is for the church to adapt, <laughs> to um, actually have an adaptive ecclesiology. Um, that's, that is the name of this part of the series. This is what we have been working towards. Um, but, um, at the end of episode 10, we left off talking about adaptive ecclesiology and captive ecclesiology for our listeners on a quick refresh, Michael, what, what are the differences there between adaptive ecclesiology and captive ecclesiology? Yeah, well, you know what? Can we say this before we get to that? Because I yes, think please. this is important. Just to, just to uh, provide a little bit more background on the meaning of ecclesia. Okay, uh, Ralph Corner, who is a colleague of mine and a friend, uh, wrote a, a really, I think, a spectacular volume on the origin and meaning of ecclesia in the early Jesus movement. He he literally studied every instance where that word occurs in Greek literature. Uh, dating back to Plato all the way through to the the first and second centuries, I think. That's and a lot. That is a lot. I don't and I don't remember now how many instances th there are, but what he concluded were three things, and I think these are important for us to keep in mind: that okay. ecclesia is a formal and it can be informal assembly and gathering or meeting for discussions and decision making purposes. That's what the original word uh, meant. He also observed that it was a, in some instances, it was a temporary group designation. So the ecclesia would come together for specific purposes at a specific time to address specific issues, but it wasn't a permanent gathering. It, it would gather just in a temporary way. And then thirdly, and here is where he sees this in the New Testament, that uh, the word is used as a permanent ongoing group designation, even when they disperse at the conclusion of the ecclesia. So the ecclesia hmm. still was a gathering place, 
but uh, the, the New Testament uses the language in such a way that there's a permanence to it. The ecclesia is always God's people gathering together. And of course, we see the, the use of that word both in the uh, Greek New Testament as well as in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So there's a consistency in its meaning. Now, what's interesting, though, about all of this is that in, in uh, the New Testament, the word is used 114 times, but it never refers to a building. It never refers to a place where a sermon is delivered, and it rarely infers a gathering on Sunday. And, and that's important for us, I think, to understand that there is such a depth and richness to this word to reduce it to just something that we do on Sunday, I think, is uh, in some ways disregarding what we see in the New Testament. Hmm. And that's why we, we emphasize the adaptive nature of, of ecclesiology. Because since it is not a, a building, since it is not just a gathering, since it describes the people who are the people of God, it has to reflect that richness yeah. all around the world that you were just talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the way in which it worships and the way in which they pray uh, in every aspect, in the way in which they gather together, uh, the, the structures that are used and all of these things, I think, have to, uh, to be thought through. And, and a part of adaptive ecclesiology is not just simply thinking creatively about how can we do this uh, differently, but thinking about the ways in which God is already at work in gathering people together. And that's what we're seeing in the New Testament, is that God is uniquely working in that time period, as he does in all time periods, uh, drawing people together in community. And what the early church, the early people of God recognized was that those were the places where they could also gather together so that the, the, that place, the uh, motivations for gathering, the activities of the gathering would act as a bridge in, into the culture. Hmm. And, and that's what I mean, like what we were talking about last time, uh, about the theocentric nature of adaptive okay. theology. It's recognizing that God's at work. He's doing something in our communities to uh, cause people to come together. And so a part of what then our responsibility is, is to make observations of those. Okay. Where is it that God's gathering people together? What does that look like? Uh, what are they doing in those gathering places? Uh, what's, what's the purpose of that gathering? Uh, and then how could we adapt what it is that we see God doing in a way that uh, would be meaningful to people? And I think this is important in that um, for those of us who are on church staffs, for those of us who are a part of mission organizations, and we we consider ourselves um, <laughs> thoroughly Christian, professionally Christian, um, oftentimes we don't do the observation step. We We don't do what's the purpose of the people in the area. We just jump to we are the church. And so because we are the church, now let's host a gathering. And mm -hmm. we're the ones, we're the church. So we set what that gathering looks like and people can come to us. And so, you know, certainly that's the attractional model um, that has so dominated the West. Um, but we do need to slow down and back up, right? That first, the first step is not gathering. The first step needs to be observation. Mm -hmm. And that observation then should impact what that gathering looks like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. And what you're describing, uh, the system that we currently have is that captive system where we've created the gathering space. And in essence, we're asking people to make the missional move to us. So if you want to, if, if you want to hear about Jesus or, you know, whatever, uh, experience God's people, then you need to come to us and, and be like us. Whereas adaptive ecclesiology is saying, you know what, the, the, Part of the mission of the church in fulfilling God's mission is making the missional move to people, just like Christ did. 
I mean, Christ did not stay uh, in the heavenly realm. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he came in the form that made sense to people. And so naturally, if we're the body of Christ, his, his expression in the world today, then what does that look like? What, what, is, what does it mean for the church to make the missional move to people? And, uh, and so that's what you're referring to. We need to make the observations. How is it that God's working among people today that uh, he is gathering them together and, and they are doing things that we might be able to adapt uh, for the purposes of God? So if somebody is listening right now and they're wondering if either their church or the way that they're going about things is from that captive mindset versus the adaptive mindset, how do we get stuck in the captive? Yeah, well, I think we become um, fascinated with our human ingenuity in uh, creating space that we think might be best for others. It's, it's in some ways, you know, I think about the story of the monkey and the fish that uh, I've told that story here right. before where, you know, the monkey is perched in his tree when a storm blows up and uh, a hurricane and, and the waves bring a fish to land on the, the beach that's underneath of his tree. And he goes down to console the fish because he knew that the fish was in distress as he saw it flopping on the sand. And so to console it, it, it picked it up and caressed it in its hand until it laid peacefully there. And then he put the fish back onto the beach thinking that he had done something really uh, great for that fish. The reality is the fish dies, but the monkey, because it, he in his system believed that this is the best for that fish, uh, uh, believed that he was doing the most generous, uh, altruistic thing possible. And sometimes we get into that mindset that, that we become the monkey, that because we've created this system that has been good for us and we enjoy it and we love the things that we do when we gather together with other people, that we naturally think that others should love it in the same way. But the reality is that people are different and, uh, and we need to be thinking like they're thinking rather than thinking that what we are thinking is good for them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So how does, I think we talked about this and we said we were going to talk about it later. Uh, then how does captive theology or captive ecclesiology impact even our leadership structures? Yeah, well, the same thing. I mean, you you just make the observation today about the prominence of the pastor, for example, um, uh, and how that has risen to the place that it is today, and uh, and and juxtapose that to uh, early church history, where we have just a handful of references in the apostolic fathers as well as in the church histories of of uh, eusebius and uh, socrates that uh, have any indication that there was anything uh even even remotely similar to that position that we have today and so so we've become captiva captivated by this pastoral role and in, in the leadership structures um, that, uh, that really are in many ways foreign to the New Testament. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that, uh, that people weren't doing their best to contextualize systems uh, to, for use today. And you mm -hmm. look in, in the case of the United States in different uh, church political systems, for example, uh, you have Congregational, Presbyterian, uh, uh, forms of government as well as uh, Episcopal forms of government, those are all adapted. And uh, um, there's no way that any one of those forms could ever say, well, this is the New Testament form. It doesn't stop them from trying. It doesn't stop them from trying. No, <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm sure I've propagated what I believe to be the New Testament form as well. 
But um, the reality is, is that we still do some adapting to our culture. Um, uh, but ultimately, in our adapting, we become captivated with those systems and we cease adapting uh, and thinking that, well, culture is just as monolithic as the church is. And so if the church, if the culture is not changing, then the church shouldn't change. And of course, the reality is that culture does change. And so we need to be thinking frequently about and quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the, and the same in the the first century. So um the point that we're getting to, though, for yeah. all of this is, uh, how do we know this to be the, the case? And what I've been trying to uh, articulate in this innovative disruption series, as well as in other places, is that the early models of the church took on many different forms. Um, there were there were forms that resembled voluntary associations, whether those were occupational or religious, for example. Um, there were Greek gatherings that the church resembled. There was the synagogue also that in some places the church would resemble. Uh, philosophical schools had much more of an influence than uh, many of us care to admit. But th there are striking similarities between philosophical schools and the early church. And then, of course, the households. I mean, we can't forget about the important impact that the uh, oikos made. And I think we sometimes misunderstand what that is, and uh, especially in our day when so many are thinking that oikos was the system of the early church and uh, are, are touting that as the system that we need to return to today. Um, when, again, the, what we see in the New Testament is that it was one of many different mm. ways in which the church uh, adapted. And then finally, the theater. Uh, I mean, we have instances of Christians gathering in huge theaters and, uh, that would seat 8,000, 12,000 people. And so, so there were many different forms that the church utilized in order to engage with the culture. Uh, and they were all forms that the culture was aware of. And so in, in some instances, uh, it, it, they acted as a bridge to the culture in order to uh, make the missional move to the people. So what you're saying is the megachurches existed long before megachurches existed? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I mean, yeah, in some ways, uh, but certainly not in the same way as it exists today. Um, and that's one of the striking differences, of course, in the first century church is that there was such a unity in that church that they weren't talking about local expressions and global expressions of the church. Um, the church was the church. The people of God were the people of God. And uh, the way in which they gathered uh, represented the diversity that was in the people of God, and, uh, and and not just the cultural diversity, but the occupational diversity, the educational diversity, the ethnic diversity as well. A lot of the things that you're even talking about are reminding me of uh, Alan and Mike's book, uh, The Shaping of Things to Come, um, which was written some 20 years ago. Uh, but that book shook my wife and I early on to continue to see, to ask those questions where, what, not just where is God moving, but where, uh, what forms are okay uh, to take as the church so that we are bringing that good news to where people are. What are the forms that they fully understand and expect? And I always felt that Alan and Mike were asking the right questions for us to see just as we're looking at this list that you've said you know that the church was through voluntary associations but it also looked like those greek gatherings but it also looked like the synagogues but it also looked like philosophical schools and households and theaters like there was there were myriad ways in which the church showed up there were myriad forms in which they were coming to the culture and they were not so foreign 
in fact, that instead of being foreign, um, it looked natural. They oh, adapted to what it, it looked like. And I think that's so important for us to realize because what it does for our missionary efforts is it tells us that we need to be looking at ways in which the church can express itself in a culture that seems natural to people. Um, and that's, that makes all the difference in the world in terms of the perception of Christianity as either being foreign or being of the culture. Um, yeah, and, and so, so important for us to see that. And important for us to see that uh, idea even as the New Testament uh, church grows into the later first century, into the second century and third century and so on. And I think what you just said was was sparking my mind. It's like you said, you know, that's so important. Well, yes, Michael, that is so important because what we're trying to say is we are not thinking of something brand new. We are not right. thinking of this idea here in our day and age and say everybody's been missing it. But it came to <laughs> it came to Michael, the resident of physiologist to finally figure this out. No, this is built in to what we see in scripture and this is built into what we see when we look back at those historical records this is what the church looked like then this is what the church was doing and it behooves us to slow down to see that there and then to reflect that today yeah. to adapt yeah. and make that missional move towards others in the name of jesus yeah so exactly well, with that thought, listeners, we're going to close here on episode 11. Thank you for spending your time with us today. Uh, if this was your first podcast, I think you might be thoroughly confused, but hopefully that was, was wonderful and beneficial. We certainly invite you to listen back to the rest of this series or go on wherever you get your podcasts and check out others from the Ephesiology podcast. Uh, even though our series is about to end, we would love to hear from you. Go to masterclasses.ephesiology.com. Click our page for innovative disruption, and we would love to interact with you there. Uh, we believe and want to live out the idea that theology is done in community. Well, for Michael and myself, thank you for joining us today on the Ephesiology Podcast. <laughs>